All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Eddie Kim, and I am the CTO here at Gusto, also one of the co-founders. Uh, the photo that you see right here it was actually taken almost exactly one year ago. Um, it, in fact, it was taken at the Gusto Next conference last year, which some of you remember was in Denver, Colorado. I remember this because this photo was in the lobby right outside where the, the hotel that we had the, the actual conference. I want to know if you've heard of this somewhat obscure technology, something that we in the tech world talk about from time to time, may or may not come up in your world, but it's this thing called ChatGPT. Raise your hand if you've heard about this thing. OK, obviously, everyone has heard about ChatGPT before. And in fact, um, one in five accountants, more than one in five accountants, have actually reported using ChatGPT on a daily basis in order to save time and improve the way that they work. And so I want to talk about generative AI, uh, large language models, what it is, how it works, and how Gusto is incorporating this technology into our product to improve the way that we all work uh, and hopefully save you a ton of time. Now, I'm the CTO of Gusto, and so one of the things as a CTO that I love is to see demos. And so what I'm actually going to do is show all of you a live demo of a couple things that we have in our product that we've built today. And you'll hopefully get to see by the end of this presentation uh, the, the transformative power that this technology will have, especially in the context of Gusto, to save all of you tons of time and improve the way that you all work. But before talking about this field of computer science that's now called generative AI, I want to talk about a slightly different field of computer science. And this is a field called uh, HCI. It stands for Human Computer Interaction. And HCI is really just a study of the interface between humans and computers. And one of the first interfaces that we had between humans and computers was called the punch cards. Some of you, I hear over here, have been around for long enough to actually remember this technology. And some of you may have actually have used this technology to work with computers. The photo that you see here is a stack of 62,500 punch cards. And it held the program to the Sage Military Computer Network. It's about five megabytes in total, and it obviously was a huge stack and uh, as tall as this woman here. Um, and this was the primary way that we interfaced with computers back then. Uh, it was invented in the late 1800s and actually lasted for a very, very long time. Um, and it wasn't until the mid-1960s where the punch cards gave way to an entirely new sort of interface with computers. And this is called the command line interface, or the CLI, as we like to call it. Uh, the CLI was basically a new way of working with computers. You use a keyboard, and you typed in a very limited set of commands or prompts that the computer would actually understand. And you could tell the computer to do all sorts of things using this command line interface. The photo that you see here is an example of a command line interface. Um, it's, uh, a, it's called a Unix shell. And this was developed by a guy named Ken Thompson in 1971 at Bell Labs. Um, it was much faster, obviously, to work with computers than, than punch cards. So that was the mid-1960s. And that lasted for you know, about 15 or so years until an entirely new interface came along to, um, to take its place. And this is called the GUI, the GUI. So the CLI gave way to the GUI, the GUI. Uh, and that stands for the Graphical User Interface. Uh, the Graphical User Interface was developed by Xerox PARC, which was a spin-off from the company Xerox, which we all know. Um, and in fact, it was invented not too far from here in San Francisco, in the city of Palo Alto, which is about a 35-minute drive south. If you have some time, highly recommend uh, checking out Palo Alto. That's where the Stanford campus sits, and you have the uh, Computer History Museum. Um, and in case you don't know, the park part of Xerox Park stands for Palo Alto Research 
center. Uh, this was a huge innovation in HCI because instead of using a keyboard to type commands into a computer, you now had a graphical representation and you had symbols on the screen that were essentially visual representations of real world things in our lives, right? So you had an icon of, say, a document or a folder. Um, they sat on a desktop uh, on the screen. And if you were done with the document, you could drag that document over using a mouse into a visual representation of, of what? Uh, a trash can, right? Which is something that we all know we use when we are done with documents. Um, so this was a huge innovation because, as you might imagine, it just all of a sudden made using computers a lot more accessible. Um, and and uh, it was a lot more intuitive than um, the, uh, the CLI, the com command line interface, and certainly the punch cards. Um, and this is what we have largely been using today. It's kind of stood the test of time. Uh, it's been around for more than 50 years now. And although we still use the CLI, and oftentimes you'll see software engineers, uh, for some use cases, uh, use a CLI because it is better than the GUI in some cases. But for the most part, the world is using the GUI as our primary interface to computers. If you have a Mac, if you, have, if you use Windows, if you have an Android phone or an iPhone, those are all examples of a graphical user interface. So that is the um, latest and greatest in uh, our, our HCI world until potentially we actually may be very lucky because we may be sitting on a cusp of another breakthrough after 50 years in a human computer interface. And that leads me to this, my original question of, of ChatGPT. Um, and the reason why I'm boring you with this whole history lesson of HCI is that it's possible that ChatGPT and its broader, uh, uh, the category of technology that it sits in, large language models and generative AI, will actually usher in a brand new interface that we have with computers, not by using punch cards, not by typing commands into a keyboard, not by clicking around with a mouse or your finger or, or zoom pinching, uh, but actually just telling a computer in your own natural language, in plain English, what is it that you want it to do, and it doing that thing for you. If you think about it, this is going to save us a ton of time, right? There are a lot of things that we do uh, through our mouse and keyboard that actually are a lot faster if you just are able to tell the computer exactly what you want it, what you want it to do. And it was really ChatGPT that kind of opened up the world's eyes on the potential of this technology to fundamentally change the way we work with computers. So what is ChatGPT and how exactly does this work? Well, as I said, ChatGPT is um, just one example of a broader set of technologies that we call large language models, um, or LLMs. As you can probably tell by now, uh, the field of computer science likes to put acronyms on, on pretty much every single thing. So LLMs is, is a large language model, and uh, ChatGPT is just one example of a large language model. There are actually many, many others out there. Uh, ones that are developed by Google, ones that are developed by Meta. There's many open source ones. Hundreds of large language models like ChatGPT actually exist, and they do very similar things that ChatGPT does. It just so happens that ChatGPT happens to be the one that gained popularity and that we all happen to, to talk about. How does a large language model actually work? Well, it's Pretty hard to explain, but an like, oversimplification is if you think about how predictive text input works on your iPhone, you type in a few words, and based on those few words that you've typed, somehow the iPhone is able to predict or guess what the next word it is that you have in mind, right? And in some cases, even able to complete your sentences, right? And so what it's doing is it's really just math, right? It's probability. It's taking a look at your sequence of words and it's asking of all the words in the dictionary and how they typically tend to be arranged in sentences, what is the probability that this word is going to come after um, the word that has been typed in so far? And if that probability is very high, it's going to present to you um, a set of words that you can now push to actually fill in. It seems like it's reading your mind, but really it just comes down to 
probability. Um, and it actually sometimes is influenced by the types of words or sentences that you yourself tend to type in, right? Um, and that's how it almost has this magical capability of seeming to be able to complete your sentences or, or read your mind. Large language models is basically kind of taking that concept to a, a, an extreme, right? Think about that, but on steroids. And instead of just filling in words uh, after a few words that you've typed, it's actually trained on the entirety of the contents of the internet, right? So anything that's been on the internet, any sentence that's been written, any sort of knowledge that's on the internet, uh, we now have the capability to take all that in and have the same probabilistic sort of interaction that we have in a very basic way with predictive text input. And that's how ChatGPT and models like ChatGPT are able to kind of construct these sentences and paragraphs and sometimes even novels that sound very natural uh, and, and real to us. Now, this is going to be an extreme oversimplification. So the, pe the real people that are actually in this field are probably cringing right now. But I do think this is a very um, high-level uh, way to think about how this, how this works. But more importantly, like, why does this matter to us? Why should this matter to any of you? And I think there's two reasons. One is, hopefully it's pretty obvious, that this has the potential to usher in a new level of productivity for everybody here. Um, just like when the internet came along, or just like when we moved from box software to cloud software, those came along for those that were able to harness and, and be proficient in this technology, they're able to all of a sudden do a lot more in a lot less time and also do higher quality work. Everyone here, to a certain extent, um, has, is very familiar. The fact that you're here uh, using Gusto means that you've been able to you know, transition from like, going to Best Buy and buying that box software to doing things on the cloud and just think about how much time it's saved for everyone here and how much more productive it's, it's been able to make each and every one of you. And large language models is a high probability that it's going to be another one of these like, inflection moments in our society where we have massive productivity gains as individuals and as a, as a society. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, and this is, goes back to my original um, spiel around HCI and human-computer interactions, I think it has the potential to fundamentally change the way we work with computers, the interface that we have with computers. Of course, the graphical user interface is going to stick around for a while, and there's many things that we do that's, go that's going to be the most optimized interface. But there's a lot that we are doing today that's going to be a lot faster, um, and we're going to work with computers potentially in a much more natural, conversational way, in the same way that we interact with each other as, as human beings. So obviously, it's really important to become really proficient in the next few years in this brand new technology. Um, but the good news, because if you're freaking out right now, uh, the good news is that you don't have to do that today. And in fact, Gusto is working really, really hard to integrate this technology in very intuitive, user-friendly ways into our product so that you don't, know how, you don't have to know how to use all this technology on day one, and you can still get the benefits of all of it, the productivity gains, the time savings, uh, doing things better in the Gusto product without having to become an expert in large language models. So I actually want to show you now a couple real-world examples, stuff that we have in our product today on how this can save you time. And I always get a little nervous when we do live demos, so let's hope that this works. All right, so as you probably know, one of the things that Gusto has in our product, uh, in, in, the, in our people platform, is an applicant tracking system. Applicant tracking system allows you uh, or your clients to post jobs, to track interviews, track interview scores, and ultimately make a higher versus no higher decision. And of course, if you make a higher decision, they'll automatically flow into the employee onboarding uh, part of our people platform. And job postings are a great way to talk to the world about all the amazing things that is going on in your firm or in your client's uh, company and be attractive to great talent that's out there. But one of the tedious things that we've heard, especially when we talk 
to employers and we talk to accountants like yourself is that um, the, the writing of the job description part actually takes a lot of time. And I think I know this because I've read it in a lot of job descriptions myself. So I completely get it. Um, so let's see how AI can be used to solve that problem. So I'm going to go to our hiring tools here. Go to the recruiting section where our applicant tracking system sits. And I'm going to post a new job. Now let's say we want to hire for a staff accountant, because our firm is growing. It's a full-time job, and uh, we want to place them in our San Jose location. We want a senior accountant who can help our clients take care of their employees. Now it's senior, so let's put a you know, pretty decent salary here. And that's the easy part, right? This is the hard part. This is the part that takes the most time. And we usually stare at the screen for a while. And so all I'm going to do is hit the generate description. And based on what we know and what you've, what you've put in so far, Gusto is actually going to generate the job description for you. Not only is it writing the job description, but it's actually going to follow your local laws uh, to know things that you have to, by law, put into that job description. So some of you are uh, very familiar with this. In some states, you have to actually include the salary range in the job posting by law. And so Gusto will know that based on things like the location of the job and follow all those local compliance rules so that you don't have to think about that. So you have here a uh, you know, fairly good job description here. Um, looks pretty good. You have an opportunity to edit it. Um, but let's say you decide that you want it to stand out a little bit more um, because it looks largely like other job descriptions that are out there. So maybe you want to do something interesting and say, make it rhyme. <laughs> and you could do other things, make it shorter, make it longer, add this many years of experience. You're just conversing with Gusto now in how you want to craft this job description. And of course, our philosophy here is what we call human in the loop, meaning that you're going to have an opportunity <laughs> Pretty good, right? A salary range of 150 to 250 a year based on experience and qualifications, clear. Comprehensive benefits we offer, you'll find medical, dental, vision, and peace of mind. And let's say you don't like that. Maybe um, you actually don't offer vision for whatever reason. You can edit it, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a philosophy that we have here called human in the loop, meaning that whatever the AI generates, you're going to always have an opportunity to review it, edit it, make sure it looks good before it gets sent out. So that's our applicant tracking system, right? Let's talk about one more example. Another thing that you all are familiar with is reporting. Um, and if you think about how reporting works, really, you go to the report section to generate a report because you have a business question that you're trying to answer. And then what happens is in your brain, you take that business question and you ask yourself, what's the report that I need to generate? What's the data that I need to answer that business question, right? Um, and Gusto has a custom reporting feature. There's a lot of you know, levers and knobs that you can uh, play with to generate the report that will answer your business question. But what if you could just ask Gusto the business question? So I'm going to scooch on over to my second demo here, go to the reports page, go to our new custom report. And now let's say something like, how much did I pay for FUDA last quarter? Maybe you, one of your clients is asking that question. And so you just ask that gusto in your own natural language, and you will see that uh, it actually selected the columns the right columns that you want in that report, it's selected the right time period, right? Uh, April 1st to uh, June 30th. And if, you, if filters are applicable, it will select the right filters into that report. And all you have to do is preview that report, and essentially, it'll give you the answer. Now, I know this demo, it actually didn't have any payrolls run in uh, Q2. So let's change it actually to, to Q3. So let's see, OK. It changed our uh, time period. That was all it changed. Let's refresh the preview here. 
And voila, there's your answer. Let's say you actually wanted to break it down by pay period, so you wanted a little more granularity here. You can select the pay period breakdown, and you can see how it was split up between two different payrolls that were run. If you feel good about it, it's pretty simple. You just run the report, and then you'll get the download um, in a CSV or a PDF, and, and you're good to go. So just think about how much easier that is than actually having to kind of think about what is the columns and how do I generate the report that I need to answer the business question that I have. So you can save that custom report, um, and you can just pull it up every time, any time. That way you don't have to ask the question again. All right, so that concludes our demo. I'll show that right there. Um, what to expect in the future? There's so much more. We're just getting started here. I just show you some stuff that we have in our product today. Uh, but you can imagine, this pervades every part of the people platform that we've built for you all. Um, you know, reporting, one example here is uh, oftentimes when you kind of have that report in hand, the next thing you have to do is synthesize and analyze that report to answer your business question, right? But I think it's a very natural next step for us, and we're working on this as we speak, for Gusto to converse back to you the answer to that question. So for example, you might ask, where are my employees located? And Gusto might just reply back that you have 20% of your employees in San Francisco, 40% in Denver, Colorado, and 20% uh, in New York, and the remainder are distributed remotely with one person in Canada. And here's a report that I generated for you so that you can verify this information. So imagine an experience like that within Gusto. How powerful is that going to be for you and for your clients? Tax notices is another area where there is a lot of implications um, that we're working on right now and how artificial intelligence and generative AI can, can help all of you. For those of you that remember, uh, I actually came up and had a fireside chat with Josh, our CEO, and I talked a little bit about AutoSolve. And at that time, we had 7% of our tax notices being automatically solved by our software. And I, and I promised you that one year from that day, which is today, we would have 17% uh, um, of tax notices solved by AutoSolve, just because we saw how powerful this was in just quickly resolving tax notices that, uh, that employers sometimes get every now and then. And I said that we would be probably be at about 17% at this point in time. Well, last quarter, we actually auto-solved 36% of notices that came in, meaning that they're solved instantly, accurately, and there's nothing else further to do after that point as soon as we receive that notice. Now, artificial intelligence, <laughs> that is worth a round of applause. Artificial intelligence and generative AI has the potential, we think, to actually increase this significantly more. And so uh, my hope is, if I'm invited back to speak again next year <laughs> at Custo Next, that I'll have another report, uh, 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 a report back to, to you on what percentage we're now solving through AutoSolve as a result of generative AI and this technology. Uh, tax credits, who I know you heard about today, is also a very exciting space. Um, we think this technology can help all of you help all, all of your clients identify opportunities to find free money for, uh, through, the, through the form of tax credits. Um, there's a lot of different tax credits out there, as you know, and we can use our data and this technology to make more easily surface the opportunities that employers have to get real money back into their bank accounts. And the last thing I'm going to give a little bit of a teaser is something that we're working on really, really exciting. I'm personally um, very involved in with the, with the Stellar team. Um, I can't share a ton about it today, but what I will share is that if you just think back on what I talked about today, right, the evolution of interfaces with computers, and, uh, and, uh, and my belief that in the next few years, many things that we do today that we do through a web browser and clicking around, or maybe on your phone by, you know, uh, filling things out, things out on a tiny little screen, um, those things will be much uh, easier to do and much quicker to do through a different kind of interface, this, not this graphical user interface, not this GUI, but perhaps what's being coined as we speak, the CUI, the conversational user interface. So I'm going to conclude by just 
summarizing what this potentially means for you and the firm. Ultimately, I think there's going to be massive time savings for everyone here by automating a lot of the simple tasks, the tedious tasks that are better suited for this sort of technology. And what that means, secondly, is that you will all have more capacity to take on more clients and grow the business. And thirdly, I think it's going to open up a lot more advisory opportunities for, uh, for all of your clients. So thanks for listening. Hopefully you got a better sense of generative AI and how we are using it here at Gusto uh, to help all of you leverage all that this technology has to promise. So I actually have a special treat for all of you. It's a treat for me. Um, we have one of the world's biggest experts in this field, artificial intelligence and generative AI, large, large language models, here with us today. Um, his name is Reza Habib, uh, Dr. Reza Habib. And I've actually asked him if he can come and spend a little bit of time with us so we can have a little conversation about generative AI. <laughs> large language models, conversational uh, user interfaces. This is something that has been introduced to most people in this world in the last 12 months. But you obviously have been working on this for a lot longer. Um, I'm curious to hear from your perspective, what got you into this field? What excites you about it? And how did, how did you end up here? Yeah, it's a great question. So I started off, I didn't, I didn't undergraduate in physics, and so I was always kind of interested in more mathematical subjects and things like that, but it's impossible not to be fast, you know, I think one of the biggest mysteries left in science is how does the mind work? Where does intelligence come from? And so I was sort of over time gradually drawn into the field of artificial intelligence, um, and I have, you know, been there for about eight years now. But I think even as someone who was in the field for the past eight years, I've been consistently wrong in terms of predicting how quickly we would make progress. Um, and I don't think I was alone in that. So I think most people in this room probably heard about AI with chat, you know, or, or became aware of large language models when ChatGPT came out in November. Um, it's easy to think that sort of everyone who was in on the know-how like knew about this beforehand and actually like, I think most people in the field were, su were equally surprised. Hmm. Um, maybe not in November, but over the last two or three years, the, the rate of progress has been really staggering and a lot faster. There's a small number of people who understood this. I, you know, there's a, you know, Ilya Suskover at OpenAI, I'd say Shane Legg at DeepMind, a couple of researchers. Um, but, the, but the vast majority of people, even within AI, did not expect the things that we're seeing now to happen as quickly as they've happened. Um, and that's led a lot of us to update how we make predictions and, and how, we, how we think it's going to you know, progress going forwards. That's, that's super interesting because like, a lot of things in this world, people have been working on, they've known about it for a long time. And then they just kind of had this moment where something happens and it, and it just like all of a sudden becomes revealed. Uh, but what you're saying is like, that's not really what happened here. Like, I mean, there have been people working on this, but even the people in the field were surprised at Ab how absolutely. good this has gotten recently. I mean, so the underlying technology is not new, right? The first versions of neural networks were done in the 1960s and 70s. Um, language models, we've all had predictive text in our phones, right? And you really, you said, you know, it's large language models are predictive text on steroids. And that's exactly right. Like, there really is very little difference between the model that does the predictive text in your phone and the model that lives inside ChatGPT or in these larger AI systems, other than scale. It just turns out that if we take those same models and we just make them bigger and we feed them more data, um, I think most people's expectation was that the models would just like, stop getting better at a certain point, right? Like, how good can you be at predictive text? Uh, and what surprised people is that as you scale these things up, they just continued improving. It's like the models wanted to learn. Um, and, and we've chatted about this before. Right? If you think about what the models need to do to keep getting better at this very simple task of next word prediction, as you train these models, you know, I've done this myself early on, you ask them to output text, they don't even know about words. right? It's just garbage that comes out. And then as they learn, they learn letter frequencies. Now you have words. OK, you've got words now. To progress beyond that, you have to start learning knowledge about the world, right? If you're going to complete the sentence, today, the president of the United States, comma, you have to know that the president of the United States is Joe Biden. Um, and if you're then going to finish a sentence that is a, an accounting report, suddenly you're going to actually need to know how to write that report. And so for the models to keep getting better, if they are going to keep getting better at this very simple task of, of just predictive text, they have to learn knowledge. Mm. They have to learn reasoning. And I think most of us just expected it just would stop working. 
um, that you're going to keep scaling it up, and at some point it'll stop. And it just hasn't. And it, and it seems to continue to be, to be working. And that's the, the interesting thing for the near future, is this isn't just, you know, I think a lot of people have been surprised by how good ChatGPT is, but what we should remember is this is the beginning of a trend, not just a single moment. Yeah. That, that's super interesting. It's exciting and kind of scary at the same time, <laughs> because like, you know, in, in a lot of reveals, uh, a field has been working on something for a long time, and you know, they may have plateaued there, like they're still getting better, but it's not like a huge breakthrough, right? And then the world comes to find out about it for whatever like ex exogenous <coughs> reason. Um, but then like the technology is still kind of puttering along. Um, what's kind of exciting about this is it's evolving very, very quickly right now. And so it's, it's a good argument to be made that we're still kind of in this like tectonic shift where things are changing and improving at a very, very rapid face, at pace, and we don't really know exactly when that plateau happens. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, for those of us who are in the field, and I mean, even people building products with it, you'll have experienced this yourself, it feels like something new is happening you know, every week or every month. Um, things that yeah. previously, the, the rate of progress has now accelerated, and also what's happened is that now that the world is aware of the potential, the amount of resources coming into the field have gone up a lot the amount of smart people working on it. I see people from physics, you know, my old field, switching what they're doing. There's more money flowing in. And so I think it's very natural to expect, you know, increased yeah. progress over the next few years. So, like, I think there's like an elephant in the room here that I have to ask, like, uh, just given the rate of progress, which is really exciting because of what it could do, but is it going, should we be scared? Uh, should accountants be scared? Obviously. Should, no, no, I'm just okay. <laughs> what, like, um, how should we think about this like, in terms of like, what, the future, what our future, good or bad, so I th I has think, to hold? Yeah, I think we should expect for this technology to become increasingly important in our lives and to become more and more human. And kind of as you described, our interactions with computers therefore start to resemble much more a human-like interaction, a conversational interface, something that understands you. Um, but I think the, the, the reality is that probably what that means, we have a choice about how this happens in society. So I think that it's not, it's not sort of going to be written for us. We, we have to be the authors of what we do with this technology, which is why I think it's so important that we have this conversation here and we all learn about what's happening and sort of have some say in that. Um, but the, the sort of optimistic version of this and what I imagine happening going forwards is that the tasks that humans don't really enjoy, that are not relationship-based, that are not about understanding stuff, the stuff that I do, right, sitting at a computer and writing software code, um, or being a researcher in the kind of maths part of it, I think those things are more amenable to automation. But the sections where you're building a relationship with someone that are more human, if anything, the value of those, I think, will go up. Um, and I think there's also this kind of fallacy that's, that people have an expectation with technological transitions in the past as well, that people assume new technology um, will destroy a lot of jobs. And there's usually some amount of job displacement, but on net, the usual effect is that we get a lot more jobs created. Um, and even within AI, this has been the, the case in the past. So the example I think that I discussed with you yesterday, um, to, the legal industry was one of the first industries to have natural language AI affect it. Um, and in particular, one of the first applications was in discovery. So when someone's being sued, there's a huge amount of information to go through. Judges were reluctant to grant discovery because it was so expensive and so time consuming. And so when the first AI models for legal discovery came in, and this was pretty early, I mean, this is sort of 15, 20 years ago when it first feels to be hit by this, the expectation was that a lot of paralegals would lose their jobs. A lot of people who had been involved in this work of going through these documents um, would no longer be needed. Um, and that was, that was sort of in the short term true, because it was a lot easier to do the same work with much fewer people. But the net result of that was that judges were much more willing to grant discovery. And so overall, a lot more discovery happened, a lot more of this work happened, and more people are employed in discovery today than they were before the automation came in, um, which is a little counterintuitive. And I expect we're going to see something like that for accounting as well, in the sense that I think the economy is going to grow a lot. I think we're going to have a lot more businesses. I think people are going to be able to do things that weren't possible before. I'd be very surprised if the net impact is a decline in jobs. Right, because so much of accountants is um, advisory, right? Uh, strategic relationship relation building and it's, it's also about trust, right? So even, even if we do get to the stage where ChatGPT can answer these questions, are you going to trust your businesses with you know, the message you got out of ChatGPT? I think you still want an expert human in the loop who you know has your best interests. Yeah. Um, and I can't see that human aspect of it changing anytime soon. One of the things that 
we care about here at Gusto um, is, and, and it's, a lot of it is just because the nature of information that we're entrusted with, right? Think about uh, social security numbers and bank account numbers and home addresses, like all that stuff. Not only that, we're moving, you know, billions of dollars um, that we have to be really good stewards of this information and treat it really sensitively. Privacy is really important aspect of everything that we do here at, at Gusto. Um, and so even though we're kind of getting excited about a lot of these AI applications, we're really careful and thoughtful about how does this preserve the privacy of the data that we have, that we're entrusted with. Um, and I know there are a lot of other companies out there that, and there's like kind of this mad rush to get into AI, and other companies that we use may not you know, have that same level of attentiveness, perhaps because they don't have as level of sensitive information as Gusto has, or perhaps they just don't care as much as Gusto cares about it. Um, in your opinion, is that a concern for you? And like, what can, what can we do in the tools that we use and in our day to day to kind of help perhaps identify where companies, where are, are the information that we're entrusting with them is being handled carefully and in a private way? I think it's a great question. And I think it's both a concern and an opportunity. So the, the concern is that if you trust these AI models with your private information, like how do you prevent them leaking that to other people or make sure that they don't say something embarrassing? And you know, I think we all saw the Bing Sydney model, or many of us did. You know, Microsoft's version of ChatGPT seemed a bit out of control. Um, do you want to give your private information to that model? Um, so th that's the concern. In my mind, the opportunity is that ChatGPT was just trained on the public internet, right? So ChatGPT was trained on all of the text information we could get from, from anywhere in the world. Um, but that also means it wasn't trained on anything private. So it doesn't know about Gusto. It doesn't know about your company. It doesn't know how you want to do things. Um, yeah. And so the opportunity is to build the versions of these AI models that have the permissions and the access to that private information that respect that privacy. You know, ChatGPT is great, but it's really limited in what you can ask it to do because it can't really, you know, like it has the intelligence of maybe a smart intern in your office, but you can't get it to do the things an intern might be able to do. <laughs> you guys, eventually, in the near future, I think like those are the kinds of tasks, right? You would, you'd like to be able to outsource to this model, but it doesn't know your work context. It doesn't know who your colleagues are. It hasn't read your emails. It doesn't know what you've been doing. And being able to find a safe, private way to give the models access to that information I think is going to unlock an enormous amount right. of capability, even without them continuing to get smarter. Yeah. And I think having someone you trust um, who's going to do that in a private way like Gusto um, means I don't think you'll get that kind of functionality from other sources. Yeah, and, and I think uh, the way Gusto is approaching it, the way I suspect like, a lot of companies should approach it, is you can start with some of these base models like ChatGPT that are kind of trained more generically. They have the capability of language and some public sort of knowledge that's out there. Um, but then there's a step that's a little bit more proprietary within your own walls of like fine tuning it and adding additional capabilities that make it more useful for the specific use case like reporting or job description that you, that you have um, in, in mind. And that part is kind of like more the part that you keep within your own Yeah, absolutely, walls. absolutely. And this, this is kind of what we specialize and doing it human loop as well. But yeah, someone, you know, OpenAI has trained this, this raw intelligence, this base model that understands lots about the world, that understands lots about language, but as we said, knows nothing about your private company, doesn't know anything about your preferences. Um, you have to find some way of taking that and adapting it to a particular use case, giving it access to the right information in a private and secure way, teaching it about the tasks that you care about doing, um, and customizing it, both in tone of voice, but also in you know, the capabilities that it has for each use case. Yeah. Um, and that is, that is non-trivial piece of work that happens afterwards um, that I think you know, is, is how you get these models to have an extra level of capability above just yeah. that base model. Awesome. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for spending some time with us and uh, really appreciate it. Absolutely. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Thank you very much, Eddie.